All right, so I'm going to turn it over to Avon, and she's going to introduce our speaker for this evening. Our speaker is Tiana Raymond. From the, she is the director of the Herbarium at the Botanical Research Institute of Texas, right here on the campus of the Fort Worth Botanic Gardens. She earned her master's in environmental science from TCU, her bachelor's in environmental science from SNU. Tiana just celebrated 20 years at Brit, where she facilitates the care, usage, and growth of the plant collection housed in the Brit Herbarium. She's an active field botanist and has contributed specimens to several Brit collections. She enjoys photography, microscopy, and biodiversity informatics. And I call her my friend, Tiana. Come share your passion with us. Thank you so much, Avon. I'm delighted to be here. Sometimes I need glasses, sometimes I don't. So you'll see me playing with them. Um, I think we'll wait till the slides come up on here. But yes, I've been at BRIT for 20 years. When I got there, we were a separate standalone institution on the east side of downtown. Some of you might be familiar with the Tyndall Warehouse storage buildings over there off the other side, uh, just by the railroad tracks. That's where I started with the organization and they couldn't get rid of me because like Avon said, I celebrated 20 years here. And so I've gotten to see the dreams of many people come to fruition when we were able to become a single organization with the Fort Worth Botanic Garden, um, because it's a pretty exciting place to be, to have the ability to study both living and preserved organisms. Now I'm gonna argue and hopefully leave you with the idea that the preserved organisms are pretty dang cool. And mine will last longer than most of my colleagues in the garden because we have some you know, 200 plus year old plants in our collection today. Um, but, uh, but hopefully you'll get a chance to see that. So the things that I'm gonna talk about today are the history and significance of herbaria. So if you've seen me talk before about herbaria, there are a few new things bit more about the history of herbaria that I have been learning. And there's a publication called Herbarium that came out in the last couple of years by author Barbara Tears. So if any of this interests you, I highly recommend it as a book that you might want to read. And I can send that book, uh, I can provide that somehow in the future. So I'm gonna start with this slide. This is, a, this is a report that came out in 2020 by the US National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, and it's called Biological Collections, Ensuring Critical Research and Education for the 21st Century. And the idea behind this report was to talk about the importance of natural history collections and the impact they can have to help us address societal problems, including things like COVID outbreaks. Um, and this of course goes beyond just plants. And just to familiarize you, you know, most of you are aware of these museums and natural history collections that we have here in this area in Dallas-Fort Worth. You can search by you can search natural history collections through the website that's listed listed on the left. This is through the Global Biodiversity Information Facility uh, for scientific collections. But here are some of those examples. So um, let's see. Have any of y'all been to the Elm Fork Heritage Museum? <gasps> I highly recommend that you take the opportunity to do so in Denton. A lot of their collections are digitized. Some of them through us, their herbarium collections, but they have many different kinds of organisms. Uh, the Schuler Museum of Paleontology at SMU at Southern Methodist University. Have any of you been there? Well, by golly, I'm just giving you a list of places that you need to go visit. Um, we've also got the Amphibian and Reptile Diversity Research Center closer by at University of Texas Arlington. Has anyone been there? <gasps> yes, Zach, I would expect you to have been there. And Suzanne, I see that as well. Um, and then what about the Monig Meteorite Museum at TCU? All right, excellent. Well, I hope that this is at least a shopping list of places that you can go. I'm gonna be talking about a natural history collection that involves preserved plants. So ultimately what I'm really discussing today uh, are, are herbaria, which consists of a object, an actual plant that's associated with data about where and when that plant was collected and what that plant is. So you're looking at an example on the screen of a theoretic plant out in nature, the label data that were created, and then the final object, which is what we have, oh, close over a million, a million, 1.4 million 
specimens that look pretty much like what you're looking at on the screen. Different plants, different data, but they go back over 200 years. And this kind of gives you the diagram of the label, but the really most important things are the actual plant and the data itself. Without those two things paired, it is no longer a scientific collection. And I'm sure many of you have browsed through um, des interior design magazines or shopping, and you've seen a lot of beautiful specimens up on the wall. Interestingly, um, you know, a lot of those are mass produced prints, but interestingly, we have found specimens that have been sold and, you know, sold as objects for art decoration that are actually true specimens that um, may or may not be duplicated in herbaria around the world. So the importance of these plants, um, there is an organization called Spinach, and I love it because even though it represents natural history collections other than plants, we get the credit of a name. It stands for the Society of the Society for the Preservation of Natural History Collections. This group helps advocate and write support letters uh, uh, to support natural history collections around uh, around the world. In fact, they have their meetings usually in the United States one year, and in odd, uh, the opposite years, it has them internationally. This next year will be in Okinawa, Japan. I'm not going, but hopefully somebody will, will represent us there. Um, but the website does go into some of the reasons herbarium specimens are important. And, you know, uh, if I think about the types of things that our specimens are being used for, um, let's see. One of the one of the things that is uh, that I had one loan request I had at one point in time was because there was a researcher who was investigating salvia. Y'all are perhaps aware of the salvia, the well, not the horticultural uh, trade, but the hallucinogen, right? So the uh, the the hallucinogen that was been being taken or is being taken by a lot of people. So this researcher in particular wanted to take samples from various species of salvia that we had in our herbarium, because if you imagine trying to sample all those salvias across where they grow would be a lot more difficult timing and costly than it was to go through herbarium specimens. So they wanted to sample many different species of salvia from our herbarium so they could analyze those samples to see if the molecules that are hallucinogenic that come from salvia divinorum were existing in other species besides that one species of salvia. So that's just one example of how they're used. Um, you know, at its very core, a herbarium is a place for identification. So we use our herbarium to identify uh, plants from all over the world. It's funny because um, we had, I think we had one, and we do this for the public. So if any of you has a, a plant you would like identified, you can send it to us if it, if iNaturalist hasn't worked for you. Uh, but if it's cultivated, it might be helpful to send it to us. Um, but we had somebody who said, oh, I have this plan. I want to bring it to you for identification. They never brought it by. Um, and then they called me again in the winter and they said, hey, I'm sorry, I didn't bring it by, but it's all dead and dried now. So I'll wait till it flowers the next time. Um, and then I told them, well, you know, we curate over a million dead plants, preserved plants. So bring it in and we were able to identify it. Um, so really what we have in our herbarium is a reference source for the identification of plants, the naming of plants, and I'll go into that later. That specimen doesn't look like too much to you, does it? Those of you that are in the front seat, I think are starting to read the label. Let me, can y'all see who that is? So this is a specimen that came to us uh, in, I think this was in 2001, so this was before my time, but we didn't have the staff to be able to take care of the, uh, to file it out and look at it in our collection at the time. We received a grant from the National Science Foundation targeting our ferns and lycophytes, and that allowed us to go through the range storage material we had, which we were keeping safe in climate controlled conditions, but hadn't had time to investigate. We pulled down that box and lo and behold, we had five specimens collected by John Muir, who's the Scots American father of national parks here in the United States. Um, so some pretty incredible treasures. And we were talking about this, I think Glenn over here brought up just before the meeting, um, how many, how there are so many collectors that have made specimens over time that were required to do it, say for UT Arlington, because I was processing some of those, but how many famous people in the world have actually collected specimens and deposited them? And there are many, and I can't think of many examples right now, so I'll, I'll come up with, with some of them soon, but... Um, all right, but this is where I get a bit into the history, but I will stop briefly there and see if there are any questions that anyone has for me so far. Anything? All right, excellent. We still have people on there. <laughs> uh, all right, that's great, great news. Um, all right, so 
these herbaria I, we have 1.42 million specimens in the Brit Herbarium. They're filed in cabinets on large sheets of paper, like I showed you earlier, as I was also handing around the room. Um, and the, the, the very interesting thing is that this process has continued for many, many years, but it originated and it's attributed to an Italian physician named Luca Ghini in the 1500s. Luca Ghini, like many botanists of the time, was a physician. He taught at the university. He taught other physicians. And up to that time, most of the plant knowledge that uh, had been accumulated and was being used for teaching was actually based off a book that was published by Dioscorides um, called Demateria Medica, which was published originally in like the six, year 65 of the common era. So at that time, that book was being used to teach about plants, but Luca Ghini liked to teach from direct observation. So right at that time, most of the medicines we had were from plants. And so he was therefore teaching about plants and he had a field botany course that he would teach. He would take his students around and he would request people send him living things. The course became so popular that he felt the need to expand classes and teach it in other seasons. But when you try to teach it in seasons other than when the plants are flowering, you're presented with the problem that you don't have any plants to teach with, right? Or you've only got vegetative material, which may be more difficult to identify uh, the plants. And so what he did is he developed something co called the hortus hyamalis or the hortus siccus, the winter garden or the dry garden. So he came up with the idea that if you just collect a plant when it is at its best state for identification, if you press and dry it very carefully, it will survive across the winter months so that you can use it to teach students. Now, this is also at a time where the illustrations of plants, I mean, you have all seen the amazing illustrations that people make of plants today that are used to identify plants. At that time, the level of illustration was not uh, precise enough, generally speaking, to be able to distinguish one species from another necessarily, probably for some of the more common things that were easily distinguished, but not for the others that had finer uh, differences between you know, the textures of the leaves, the types of hairs, the size and shapes of flowers. So his method uh, is the one that we still use today. However, we call it the herbarium today. He didn't call it the herbarium then. The term herbarium is actually attributed to Tournefort, who was a French botanist. Um, and he's the one who really got the word herbarium used in common parlance to refer to this reference library of preserved specimens with associated data. Uh, his uh, Luca Guini's herbarium does not survive. Some of his students' herbaria do survive and those of his correspondence. And I'll show you some pictures from those in a second. Um, but of course, Tournefort's herbarium does, does still survive. So this is lovely. And because I know we're all romantics a bit as well, some of the earliest herbaria that survive are attributed to Francesco Petrolini, who was a, a correspondent uh, of Luca Ghini. And these herbaria today are cared for in Leiden and in the Netherlands. And uh, it's the Antibi herbarium, which is about 1558. And then the Chibo herbarium, which is about 1532. The next slide is from the Antibi herbarium. And it's called Antibi as short for the Latin inscription that's written on the inside of the book. And I'll, uh, Antibi perpetuus ridentum floribus hortum, which apparently translates to here for you, a smiling garden of everlasting flowers. So the notion that these cared for properly would last into the future, be of use to students into the future. Um, but you can now imagine that we're learning about these plants. These students are learning about these plants, but they're also now creating this historic record. We now have specimens with a location and you can see all the parts of the plant that exist perhaps still today. And we can start to ask our ourselves differences about where and when those plants were growing and flowering then and today. You know, as we're photographing all these things, the value of photograph, can, you know, to, to identify something is, is important. But the fact that you could sample a leaf from here and you could compare the climatic conditions of the atmosphere in which that plant was growing to those today, that's phenomenal. And that's one of the studies that was actually done with herbarium specimens, looking at specimens collected by Lewis and Clark at the time then, the specimens they collected, and looking at the same species from the same areas at a much later date, 200 years from then. And so you were able to start to look at, well, 
what are the stomata doing? What are the morphological, what are the shape anatomical characters of the leaves of the plant that are different? And can they be correlated with anything in the environment? And just this is just one aspect, one way that natural history collections can maybe not in isolation, but uh, together start to help us address the changes in the past and today. Um, so because I promised a little bit of art as well, I can't get away but to show you uh, some other ancient or older specimens from the 1500s. Uh, this is Herbarium vivum. So this is a herbarium by Hieronymus Harder who, oh, was he East India? No, that's the Clifford Herbarium. Uh, so one of the things he did was he commissioned these specimens, but he commissioned artists to go ahead and illustrate the parts of the plant that weren't present on the preserved and dried uh, specimen. So you can see over here, for example, the fern in the middle image. It's got the fern and the bottom growing out of uh, what looks like bricks down at the bottom. And then up higher, you can see it growing on perhaps a mound of earth. So in this way, they were able to theoretically, truthfully, illustrate the habitat in which the plant was growing or the parts of the plant that didn't get pressed. Um, you can see some over here. So this this almost looks like um, Aristolochia. Pipe vine, uh, what's the comment? It, pipe vine swallowtail likes this plant here in this area. Aristolochia, Dutchman's pipe, right? That's a common name, yeah. Dutchman's pipe, you can see that they've illustrated some of those uh, buds perhaps and fruit, let's see. And then just to give you a little bit more, and I should say that that method was not really, didn't really continue beyond Tyronymus because it was very time intensive uh, to do that. Uh, but here, perhaps a slightly less time intensive uh, practice. So this is the Clifford Herbarium, who was one of the directors of the East India Company. We're now in the 1700s. He's got a connection to Linnaeus because he hired Linnaeus, uh, Carolus Linnaeus. He hired him as a botanist and physician. Uh, for his personal herbarium, and one of his affectations of Clifford's was to the specimens were actually nested in uh, in um, vases of plants that were stuck on top of the plant itself. So some other pretty pretty incredible, and both those herbaria survive. Um, well, you can see the images here. So. That gives us a nice segue into Linnaeus, Swedish botanist. I don't think I have to talk too much about him, so I'll take an opportunity to skip things in here. But Linnaeus is attributed with the using her or creating herbarium specimens really the way we do today, in that all the prior herbaria were bound into books. So they were all, were all created as bound books, which were damaging to specimens, right? When you had to flip pages. Those books were often arranged according to the understanding at the time of how the plants were maybe related to one another or uses or various reasons. As you all know, Linnaeus came up with a slightly different method for the relationship between these plants and organizing them and classifying them into groups of plants based on sexual parts. So the advantage now of taking specimens out of books and having them loose leaf means that you can put them in groups, whichever groups you like, based on as your understanding about those plants changes and you start to realize, oh, wait a minute, these two things looked alike, but there's more similarities over here. You can move that sheet, that herbarium specimen from bucket to bucket to reflect how you're understanding these things. So he basically, uh, and actually I think it's the next slide. Yep. On the left-hand side, that is Linnaeus's cabinet. So this is the first one of the first herbarium cabinets uh, in that he was able to move those specimens from cubby to cubby and label those cubbies however he wanted to. And so you can see that that practice hasn't changed much today. So here's a cabinet here in the Brit Herbarium across the parking lot. Um, that's Paula Billman, one of our volunteers, filing specimens. <clears throat> And then just a little bit more, but this is about the herbarium today, a collection of dried plants mounted, labeled, and systematically arranged for scientific use. So we all know, I think many of you probably that have, you know, are working with plant names are familiar that the milkweeds are no longer, the, well, they're still the milkweeds, but they're no longer in the milkweed family. They're now in the dogbane family. So one of the things that this, they're now 
put into the dog bane family. So one of the things that having them in folders like this lets us do is shift those things around. Now with a million, over a million specimens, that's not an easy task. And so we don't readily do that, um, but we do have plans to move forward and hopefully update some of our collections. We have specimens from all over the world. So we have specimens from Texas and the Southern United States, and that's where we concentrate. But we have specimens that, that uh, cross the globe and there are herbaria across the globe. So this is going to be a presentation that gives you a list of places you want to visit. Uh, so now we're going to the international. Um, this website, it's called Index Herbariorum. If you Google that, you'll come to a page that's hosted by the New York Botanical Garden. It lists all the herbaria. It's a registry. It's a global registry of herbaria across the world. So I think, when did I pull these data from? Oh, I didn't put this. This was probably just last year. But if you look at it in the United States alone, there are over 700 herbaria. Worldwide, over 3,500 herbaria. And these herbaria all hold specimens that specialize perhaps in different things very closely in a geography of an area or taxonomically. Um, and you can see the five largest in the world I've listed up here, the Royal Botanic Gardens Kew. Has anyone in the room had a chance to go to Kew? Yes. Did you see the herbarium? Oh, best. The herbarium are usually the best kept secret at some of these places. So you have to go. Um, and as some of you may know, there's current discussions about the Q herbarium and moving it off site. And there's a big uh, attempt to try to keep the herbarium there on the grounds of, of the Q Botanic Gardens and not an off site facility. So um, very important to keep it there where people are working and it's accessible, especially accessible. All right. Two largest in the United States are the Missouri Botanical Garden and the New York Botanical Garden. <clears throat> Here's our Philocology Herbarium. So over here across the parking lot, just about 1.45 million scientific specimens. We have about 2,500 square feet of climate controlled facility. This is important. That, that report I showed you that was published in 2020, one of the most important things that the findings from that report was that having secure places to store these natural history collections is extremely important. Um, so we are fortunate in that our building was built in 2011. So it is built specifically for this intent to protect the plants, to keep the temperature humidity down so it doesn't affect the plants and to prevent pests from coming in. We have three full-time staff at we welcome all, everyone to come to the herbarium. We had a group of students come by. Uh, this was FFA and 4-Hers that were studying for a plant ID exam. And uh, they signed our logbook. And one of them said, this place looks like NASA. Because if you, it was great. If you look in that on the left-hand side, that is the very sterile looking central hallway of our herbarium. But once you open the doors, it becomes a much different story. So this is just to tell you a little bit about the process of collecting. I'm gonna check the time. <clears throat> so uh, the, the, the process of actually collecting the plant, that is, uh, that, is, that is the responsibility of the collector who may or may not be associated directly with the herbarium or be employed by the herbarium. I think many of y'all know Jeff Quayle uh, or we have people in this room that have collected specimens. Um, and so on the left-hand side, the collector is responsible for collecting the specimen and its data, for pressing and drying it, because what's the point of having collected it if it turns into a mold specimen, um, and for generating the label, because that's where all that scientific data is communicated on the plant. Once it is gifted or entrusted to an herbarium, we take it under our purview to mount that plant, so to affix it to archival quality cardstock so it's preserved, Ideally, we don't do that, right? Because you want to see both sides of the plant. But unfortunately, it's the only way to guarantee that you don't end up with a brittle collection of, of, of crumbles. Um, we accept the responsibility to digitize those specimens. And what that means is we're taking a photograph of it and we're putting that online so people can access it that way. Um, traditionally, working with plants and traveling to all these herbaria to see your plants, uh, is, is has been limited to the people that have the funding to do so. So if we can get these put online, it means people have access to them that need them, that can't afford to necessarily travel. But it also means you can start to use these for really, to ask really cool, big questions, uh, thinking of big data. And then of course, to file and, and guarantee access. 
Okay, I'm going to take a quick break. I don't, do we have any questions? Okay, yeah. Okay, that was a really good question from the audience in the room. And what is, uh, the question was, what if we already have an example or duplicate of what somebody is wanting to give us? Um, if you think about it as a huge statistical problem, we will likely rarely ever have a duplicate of what you're trying to give us. You may be giving us a common sunflower, but we don't have that common sunflower collected from the same location on the same date that you collected it. And if you start to think about it again, like a big statistical problem, if I can now say all these plants are the same species, but now I have this same plant in the same location collected over time, well, what can I start? I can start to ask questions like, is it flowering at the same time every year? Are the flowers as large as they've always been? Are they smaller? Um, and I can start to ask some of those questions. So I would say that we all have finite space into which we might grow, but generally speaking, we don't turn those sorts of things away. There is the exception that typically when somebody goes out to collect a plant, so my first ever collection was Tiana Raymond collection number one, and I collected probably five duplicates because I collected all five from the same tree and I gave it the same label and I kept one at Brit and the other ones I would send out to other institutions. It's kind of an insurance policy. So that would be a true duplicate. And in that case, I would take that specimen and I would offer it to another herbarium that doesn't have the specimen. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, so I have two slides just to talk about collecting, and then I'll talk briefly about an example. It's not from North Central Texas, uh, but it's an example from the Philippines, which is one of our other projects. But the main big thing here is to collect with purpose. Y'all are probably familiar with that map on the left-hand side. When we talk about purpose for collecting, uh, there may be very different purposes for collecting. And maybe a master student who's trying to do a, a flora of a country to, or a county to figure out what plants are growing there. Um, it might be somebody who is studying mistletoes and they're just collecting mistletoes. So it may vary, or you're just studying as a student to learn your plants. One purpose might be to fill the gaps that we have in what we know about a plant's distribution. So if you look at that map here, I can't remember what species it. Oh, uh, American elm. I just pulled a map of an American elm up and you can see there's a lot of holes and we know that the plant is there. It's just not been collected from there. So that might be one example where it might be a useful reason to collect. These are some other uh, Points about collecting, which I'll mention briefly, collect with purpose. Make sure you collect with permit. Make sure you have the permission from the owner of that land to collect and to deposit somewhere, to deposit an herbarium. Collect with conservation. You never want to collect when your collecting would affect uh, the future propagation of that plant. So in general, depending on whether it's a rare or common plant, and you may not know that, uh, we say you have to have at least 10 specimens out there before you can even collect one. If it's a rare plant, you really want 20. So usually when I'm teaching students, I say, make sure there are 20 examples of that plant before you make a collection. The cool thing is how many of you are iNaturalist users? All right. Well, the very cool thing is that now we have another way to record those data using photographs. And I'm sure many of you have been uh, perhaps reached out to by researchers that are interested perhaps in observations you've made and said, hey, where did, you know, can you tell me more about that? And that gives us the opportunity to go back out and make a plant collection there as warranted. Um, collect representative, identifiable specimens. So there are some occasions where we'll turn away donations. And one is if it is a very poor specimen that has, that doesn't display the characters needed to identify it. Um, so if you brought me a grass with no roots and no flowering parts, I might say, let's talk about how to make a collection. And we might go back to the drawing board, um, but, uh, but yeah. And then, of course, drying and pressing the specimens and depositing in a publicly accessible location. So uh, there's a lot of text on this slide, but I will communicate it all verbally so you don't have to read it. But this is my example of collecting. We have a big uh, National Science Foundation funded project uh, that's collecting plants and lichens in the Southern Philippines. And I think it's a, just a wonderful example to show you of a big project that's collecting plants so you can see the process. So just to let you know, yep, we're over here in Texas. This is where we're talking about this collection happening. Getting there takes two days, four airplanes and a bus. So a really long time to get 
to our collaborators at Central Mindanao University in the Southern Philippines. And it's a really big team. So there's lots of permits that have to be communicated. Uh, the way that this project works, because if you have a large group like this, you're gonna decimate the population of everything if you go out and collect, is we divide into groups of plants. We had two teams collecting seed plants, those plants that produce seeds. We had two teams collecting ferns and lycophytes. Uh, we had two teams collecting bryophytes, mosses, liverworts, hornworts. And we had two teams collecting lichens. And it's pretty incredible the diversity you have. And they're all these teams involved students. Um, and then just to give you some examples, some plants were on the ground or easy to collect like that orchid that's epiphytic, right? It's growing up on the on top of another plant. Sometimes the plants were super uh, high up in the canopy. So you can see here in this occasion here, Nico, that's part one of our field team members. He was one of the botanists. He was climbing up that tree and then we handed it to him. Can y'all see there's also a pruning pole over there? So once he climbed up that tree, we handed him a pruning pole and he was able to collect the plant that was up there. Um, and then of course, well, actually that was also an epiphyte. This is the team collect writing all the data up. Those are our data sheets. If you've ever used write in the rain books, this is the method that we were using because it's so rainy. Uh, this paper allows you to write without it bleeding in the rain. Of course, umbrellas, GPS units, so you can record the location where you've collected your plant. Um, images, so that's a, a critical part of this specimen. So the cool thing that I've started doing, all of y'all that are making iNaturalist observations, I've started, uh, at least in my practice, and I know many people are doing it, when I make my field collection, I make an iNaturalist observation. I've been trying to go back to those observations and mark them when I've made a herbarium specimen so you can see where that's deposited. Um, so that that's working. And I should say in online databases where you can access these specimens, I'm linking it back to iNaturalist as well. Here are some of the images we took. Do y'all recognize that plant? It's not something we have here in North Central Texas. Look, those of you that cook. No, but good. Thank you for suggesting. No, uh, think about um, fall, Thanksgiving. It is, this is nutmeg. So this is actually not Maristica fragrance, but this is that same family and a lot of them look really similar. So that red part is an arrow that surrounds the, an oil rich um, layer that surrounds the seed. So that's where mace comes from. And then nutmeg comes from the seed itself. So they're all, they all look a bit alike. And then we're also collecting tissue samples. So this goes into, it's another form of preserved collections that we have a small one of a Brit. It's a biorepository because the process of bringing these specimens back from the Philippines, right? You have to dry them quickly or they'll develop mold. And so one of the things we do is we put, uh, we douse them with um, alcohol. And so that denatures, so you'll end up having to have that DNA tissue or the DNA most easily extracted from the leaf tissues that were preserved separately. Field work. This is some of the forms of transportation, a jeepney. Some of you might be familiar with those. Here's a, a dump truck, a raft and boats, so rather glamorous. And then um, the preservation, this is a plant press in the field. So this is the first step of collecting it to press it flat. You can see more examples of that, more pressing. And then I don't know, let's see. I don't know how to hit play. Oh, there we go. So remember I mentioned that we're trying to inhibit the growth of mold in these specimens because we don't have access to drying facilities when in the field. So this is what happens to them. So he's pouring alcohol in there and really dousing them. So one of the things that we're, we're very fortunate to have is volunteers in the Brit Herbarium that help us mount these specimens. So I hope Avon and Glenn that you're watching this and you're looking at this and understanding why some of the ferns that we're mounting right now from the Philippines are, uh, very dry and brittle and brown. So I'm gonna skip ahead. All right, then the specimens get re-dried when we get back to the field station. They then get sent to the, sent to the United States, but there's all sorts of permits. Remember I mentioned uh, collecting permits and permission to collect. There's a lot of those things that are in-country collaborators sort out, but there's also permits we have to have on our end. 
primarily from the USDA. Here's some of the activity that is made possible by the volunteers that work with us in the herbarium because each trip probably generates 5,000 specimens if you look at all taxa. Um, yeah. And then just to tell you what happens when they get in here, they freeze, we freeze the plants, we mount them with archival materials, we photograph them, we type the label information online, we try to georeference it if you didn't provide a coordinate to us, we file them in the cabinets and then we put them online. I've already shown you the cabinets. And then, all right, so that's the end of my collecting, but now I want to show you how you can access the specimens yourselves um, in our herbarium, if not physically, you are all here so you can make an appointment and just come visit us. But this is a National Science Foundation project that we have in the herbarium to digitize our plants from Texas and Oklahoma. So this is probably of interest to all of you. And I, as people that are interested in native plants and where they grow, where the earliest collections were made, I think this will be a particular interest to you. It's been a four-year grant, but we're probably going to go into six years with some extension requests. Um, and with no further ado, this is where it's all at. So there's a QR code on this screen, and it's bigger. There's a bigger version on the next screen, but this is all available. And I'm sorry you can't see it because I don't want to click any buttons and we might lose the, the feed again. Um, but portal.torchherbaria.org portal.torkherbaria.org. If you go to search, you can end up searching multiple herbaria and entering in search criteria here. I'm not going to give you the live present the live search just because I'm not sure of internet access, but I wanted to show you, and I'll read those of you that can't see that title. This says Tarrant County, Texas specimen records online. There's a caveat. These are the specimens that are as yet digitized. That means it's not necessarily all the specimens collected in Tarrant County around the world. It's just what's been made available online. So right now, if you search that I find 19,013 specimens collected in Tarrant County. Since the oldest specimen I was able to find a record for to verify was collected in 1876. And you'll see that specimen in a minute. Um, of those 19,000, there's only about 15,000 that have photographs of the specimens online right now. So that's still a bit of the process to get them online. The most recent specimen, 2023, happens to be one of our volunteers in the Brit Herbarium, Mary Keller. She collected a china berry in the garden as part of our trying to document some of the plants in the garden that are going to be hopefully taken care of by goats. So if you want to hear more about goats in the garden, just peruse our website and start putting goat goat in the search string. Um, but here's the cool part. So this is the other reason that digitization and putting these online is so important. Tarrant County specimens exist in more than 90 herbaria. The download wasn't working for me when I tried, so I manually counted, and then I lost count after about 87. So I'm, I'm, this is a rough estimate. Um, but those specimens exist everywhere. So if you're trying to study what's going on in Tarrant County, other than visiting those herbaria or asking them to loan you specimens, this is the best way to be able to do that. Here's that website again, in case you'd like to take a picture of that slide. Did you have any questions so far? No. Or does anyone in the room have any questions? It's free and available for anyone to access. Uh, Right now, we just uh, uh, just at the end of last year, we received specimens that were collected in January of 2023. Because some of those specimens are also controlled by the Convention on the International Trade of Endangered Species, they're still not here from that same expedition. Once they get here, it takes a really long time for, we have one staff member employed who helps with that and has volunteers assist her. Um, and it takes a really long time to organize them, to organize the data, to pair the data, print the labels and insert them. So uh, fortunately we have a, an old intern who's back and helping us right now with her. Um, nothing. Just a lot of comments on how interesting and fascinating this presentation is. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. I, I, I love what I do 20 years later. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. 
Yeah, so there have been multiple new species to science discovered on that project. So I'm not on the PI leads. I was fortunate enough to go last year, but they have, I don't know what the tally is of new species that they've discovered, um, but that's a really good question because people often say, did you discover something new in the field? But it's not until you bring that specimen back to the herbarium where you compare it against all known other things that you can decide it's a new species. So I didn't get too much into that, but that's one of the other values of an herbarium is you can come back to the herbarium and you can say, does this look like anything else that's named or that's in the literature? Yeah, Frank? Question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so for those of you on Zoom, my apologies. The question initially was, uh, have you discovered new species in the Philippines on that project? And the answer was yes. And hopefully you remember the rest of my response. Um, but I'm happy to answer it again later. So I wanted to just let you know that you can do searches for whatever criteria, well, whatever fields are there, but you can do searches in the portal yourself. So I promised Avon, since she would be introducing me, that I would do a search for a specimen that was collected on our birthday because she didn't tell you, but we're also birthday twins. Uh, we were both born on the 26th of January. And as you know, in Texas, what's flowering in the 26th of January, Avon, Taraxacum officinale, so a dandelion. We got a dandelion. Um, so, and <laughs> so uh, this is a beautiful specimen. And I should say that this is a specimen that was photographed from the University of uh, Texas, El Paso. So the portal that I keep talking about, it's not just the Brit herbarium, it's many, many different herbaria, those 90 plus I mentioned. Um, and it was at the University of Texas, El Paso. And you asked that question earlier about duplicates. And you can see it was originally correct collected at the Texas by the Texas A&M Herbarium and then sent on. But I know you might want to know what the oldest specimen that I could find and verify online collected in Tarrant County. It's this specimen here. Can y'all see this writing right there? You recognize the name, Revershawn? So the earliest collection that I could find that has yet been digitized that's online uh, with a photograph was this one collected by Julian Revershawn. Uh, and it says Tarrant County, Sycamore Creek. Do y'all know where that is? Yeah. So one of the things that I'm not really going to talk about tonight, but is we do have a virtual volunteer program called the Armchair Botanist. I'll give you a website at the end. But part of that project, and it was made possible by volunteers, is we took all the photographs of the specimens collected in Texas and Oklahoma, we put them online and volunteers, some of you in this room, assisted us with taking, interpreting that handwriting or those types of data and typing it into a database so that you could find it. The next step of that process is taking all the things that were typed into the database and figuring out if I had to put a point on a map for where that plant was collected, what is that point? And how sure am I of that being the exact point where that plant was collected? That becomes important when you want to look at geographic information systems, right? And you want to take where those plants grew and lay it over with soil maps or other species maps. So you can start to see certain species always grow with one another. And so um, that's another element that we have that's, that's available to you. It's a lot of studying. Oh, and I'm sorry, let me go back a bit, but I just wanted to credit. So this image over here, for those of you that have a little bit of trouble looking at the dried specimen, here's a picture. So that's the oldest collection in Tarrant County. Here is the one of the most recent research grade records from my naturalist of the same species. So this is Ben Deer 44 John, and this was observed in October of 23 in Arlington. So just on the Tarrant County side line. <clears throat> and this is just a brief slide. Um, about iNaturalist, and I know you've seen this slide before because I took it from their website, but it's just to show that iNaturalist and herbarium specimens are complementary tools for us to study biodiversity, um, and that both, both things are pretty powerful tools. Students, interns, volunteers are welcome at our herbarium and many other herbaria. Other herbaria around the U.S. may have uh, different limitations for who can access or work with their collections, um, but you can volunteer or visit with us in person virtually. That first link that's in blue is brit.org slash armchair botanist. That will take you to our virtual volunteering page where you can, uh, I should tell you that we have to update it to tell you when the next event is, but it'll tell you the kinds of things that are going on. And then of course, if you'd like to volunteer for us at the garden anywhere, there's a website there. 
We have graduate students right now, some at Texas Christian University and some at UT Arlington. Uh, we also have internships. We've got paid summer internships in our research department, and we had paid semester internships. They're currently filled for the spring, but we will have at least two paid internships in the summer. So if any of you knows anybody that's interested, please have them keep checking the website, and it's listed down at the bottom of this slide. It's under the volunteer category on our webpage if you just go straight to the webpage. And then if you're interested in learning more, we do have a monthly lunchtime lecture series. And uh, the next one coming up, I think will be of big interest to this group. We have a new research botanist working with us. Her name is Kay Hankins, and she'll be giving a lecture on the 6th of February. It will be a hybrid lecture. So she will be presenting, it'll be accessible through Zoom. If you go to this webpage, just make sure you scroll to the bottom, you'll see the Zoom link. Um, but it'll also be here on site at the Brit building across the parking lot. Um, and the topic of that is conserving plant biodiversity, native seed collection and predictive species distribution modeling. So Kay would really like to get to know all of you. She's new to the DFW area um, and she'll be working with Dr. Brooke Best on our Texas plant conservation program. Okay, lots of stuff online because we're not all tired of being online, but we do have some YouTube playlists. Um, I mentioned the Armchair Botanist Volunteer Program, but we do offer forums that are open to anyone. They're once a month. They're typically the second Thursday. Um, so we have one coming up on the 8th of February. Uh, the topic of that one is not on the website yet, but we're going to do kind of a roundup of all the contributions everyone's made in the last year. Um, so it should be pretty cool. And some of the cool stories we've, we've got out of that. And then Sheila and I were just talking about this. So those of you that remember, Butterflies in the Garden is back. And it starts on the 1st of March. So if you'd like to come see um, primarily non-native butterflies released in our conservatory, um, that please come come and visit uh, visit the garden for that. And that's it. So thank you very much. Yes, go ahead. There's a question. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. So most certainly. So the question for the Zoom audience uh, from the audience here in, in person was about phenology, right? So when plants flower, when they fruit, and the question was an ideal specimen has all the parts, the root, the flowers. So does that affect how you collect or duplicates in your collection? Um, and it does. So ideally we want things that are flowering or fruiting. Um, and it does phenology. So when those flowers, the timing of when those flowers are out does matter. And so as people are studying certain groups of plants, they go to herbarium specimens and they now go to iNaturalist to see, oh, I'm interested in spiranthes, you know, the ladies trusses, when do they flower? And they will go to iNaturalist, look up the species, look up the area and see what's flowering. Um, so, so yes, phenology is important. I will say there are exceptions. So y'all imagine uh, uh, red buds, right? So red buds, when they're flowering, you don't have any leaves on them, right? So you can't get leaves and flowers. So there are some times that the plant will just not cooperate and you're stuck with collecting whatever's there. What it all boils down to is you want something that's identifiable. There are a few other exceptions when people are doing ecological studies or you're only able, able to get to one place at one time, you know, you'll never be back. Then there's the opportunity to collect sterile, what we call sterile samples that they have no reproductive parts. Um, so that happens and we have them in our collection. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. Can you preserve color of flowers like an alcohol? Is there any way to preserve the color without describing it? Yeah, so there, the question from the audience was, is there any way to preserve the flower? There are, uh, there are ways to preserve it for a little while, but, you know, things that last hundreds of years are going to fade eventually anyway. Putting them in alcohol usually bleaches the color. Um, typically, 
people are now people are taking digital images. Those can still be fooled. I know, you know, many of you have seen digital images that if they don't have a little color scale or a color balance in the image, then it's hard to know what the color is after the fact. Um, we were just talking about this the other day that have, are any of the geologists in the audience or studied soils? Do you remember the Munsell soil charts? So these are, uh, these are color chipped charts that help you characterize soils. And so uh, I know that there are botanists that will use those. So they'll go in the field and they'll take it and compare it to the color of the plant and the soil. And they may label that on their specimens. But I will say in general, botanists do a poor job of recording flower color in an objective way on labels. <laughs> yeah. Good question. Yeah, go ahead, Dana. Looking forward to the luncheon on the 6th. Mm -hmm. How can we ensure we get the email with the link? Oh, excellent. So um, the, so the question from Zoom, I think, well, I think all of y'all heard it and saw it in the audience. So the, the February 6th lunchtime lecture, if you go to our website, um, the FWBG website and type in lunchtime lecture or look at events, I think we have a calendar on there, you'll get to the event page. The Zoom link should be posted on that event page or there will be a registration link to get the link on that page. I believe it is the former. So I believe we just post the Zoom link directly on that page. If not, my email address is up there. Send me an email and I will make sure you get the invitation to that Zoom uh, session. Um, we do have a smaller email distribution list that's not the whole membership of the garden. But if you'd like to be on that distribution list, which usually alerts you about research happenings from our research department, send me an email and I'll make sure I, I get you on that list as well. Yeah, go ahead, Karen. So the question from Karen was, what is the process of pressing the specimen after you gather it in the field? Um, so it depends on how close you are. So if I were going, you know, if I were right out here collecting a plant in the parking lot, I would go grab the plant with my shears, perhaps if it was a tree, make sure it was a flowering or branch or fruiting branch. And I would bring it back in here and I would put it into a wooden plant press. And those of you that are on Zoom, if you Google wooden plant press, it'll come up with an image. Hopefully the same as what I'm showing everyone in the audience here. So this is a typical wooden plant press. The plant will go in here in a piece of newspaper with an identifier. So in my notes, I'll write Tiana Raymond number one. In my notebook, I'll write Tiana Raymond number one. And I will start to write notes about how tall the tree was, what color the flowers were, what they smelled like, if there was latex or a sap that the tree exuded. Um, and then I would take that pressed plant that was in the newspaper, sandwich it between um, blotter paper and then through cardboards. And I would squish it flat by cinching the straps. And then I'd put it into a plant dryer and probably sit it in there for a couple of days. Oh, or if it was summertime here, I'd put it in my garage and it would be just fine. So. Um, something to that effect. And then it would go through a freezing process to kill off any insects before we allowed it into the herbarium. And then if I was fortunate, Avon and Glenn would be willing to help me mount my plant specimen, maybe. And and the other volunteers that work with us in the plant preservation studio. Yeah. So question, can you <laughs> use a dehydrator? So the question was, can you use a dehydrator? I have not seen it used for flowering plants, but it is commonly used for... Um, although it might be for fruits, um, but it's commonly used for fungus collections. So we do have a fungal collection uh, in the herbarium, and we do have a food dehydrator specifically for that reason that's on our loading dock so the spores don't get projected everywhere. Um, so yes, you can use one. Are there any other questions for me? I'm just curious, with all these plants and stuff, and you're reading about how we've developed and farmed and everything that's only like 15 percent preserved the land in the united states i mean <laughs> um, you have all these plants are so extinct or how would you know that it's extinct yeah so the the question from the audience was about um was about our land use patterns and how so little land is left out of cultivation and whether or not we have um plants that are extinct in our collection and how we know if they are extinct. So I would say, I'm sure we do that we don't, I'm sure we have plants in our collection that are extinct that we don't know are extinct. There remain in our herbarium, many species new to science that have yet to be discovered, right? So in an herbarium, you've got 
say that common sunflower that you can spread out all in front of you. And it's only when you start to look at all of these sunflowers under, you know, uh, at the same time, and you can look at them across time and space that you start to notice differences and realizing that this is different enough from all these others. I've sampled the DNA of these. I've looked at them molecularly. They are different enough from all these others to know it's a new species. So it is highly likely based on how much land we've lost that we have specimens that are no longer existing in the wild. Um, we do, so uh, you may be familiar with the IUCN red list, right? So this is a global effort to list plants conservation statuses. Um, so you can go there and see plants that are listed as extinct in the wild. And there's a process by which botanists, some of my colleagues, uh, the research botanists at Brit that have done these assessments to see, is this plant endangered? Is it not endangered? Is it extinct? Do we know if it still exists? But there's also wonderful success stories, right? So there are plants that we haven't seen for many, many years that we find that are still in existence or rediscovered. We were just not looking in the right place. You all have some kind of seed bank to preserve? Yeah, good question. Uh, that February 6th lecture, that's going to be, she's actually, Kay Hankins, one of her primary responsibilities will be working with our seed bank. So we are fortunate that we have a seed bank that concentrates on rare plants of Texas. Um, and she can tell you a lot more about that when, we, when we've got it. But yes, we do have one. Um, duplicates get sent to Fort Collins, um, is my understanding, but she can answer more of that. Yeah, Zach. Outside of herbariums, or even with herbariums, do y'all share data with herbariums or natural history museums? Or like, how does that work with, I mean, museum studies uh, has kind of got me like- Yeah. So, you know, it's funny that you ask that because traditionally, you know, before we started digitizing specimens and I could go online and just check and see who has specimens from Tarrant County, what I had to do or what a curator had to do was think about, huh, what botanists have I read their publications, do I know, have come through Tarrant County? And of those botanists that have traveled through Tarrant County, where is their home institution? So where are they likely to have deposited specimens? And then I would write an email to that curator and say, hey, I think I'm studying this group of plants or this area, and I think you had researchers that came through here. Can you tell me what you have? And then maybe I can put a request to borrow them. Um, so it was a much more prolonged uh, process. Now that they're digitized, if they're digitized, I can go online and look. So typically the process now is people start by looking at that portal that I showed you, the, the torch portal, or they'll go to the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, which is GBIF. I didn't repeat the question. Sorry, Frank. Uh, and, um, and they'll look online to see what specimens are digitized. And usually they'll follow up by going, uh, following up with curators directly as well. So it's a mix of things now. Does that help answer the question? Okay, and, and, and I should say that this will be useful for you too, that one of the um, standard languages, so a lot of you may have been associated with libraries know about Dublin Core standards to describe data. So we've got biodiversity data standards called Darwin Core. And so things that are in Darwin Core formats allow for better communication across different computer systems, at least for those things. Um, and so for those of you that may be wondering, uh, the question had to do with natural history museums and how they exchange data and how they interact. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much for having me again. Um, very much. <laughs>